But um, if you've got a question throughout the council meeting, um, just use the blue hand raise hand function and we'll, and we'll answer questions that way and go through a speaking order. Um, but when it comes time to moving and seconding reports or um, voting for or against reports, we'll just do a show of hands on the screen and that way we can show the public um, exactly who's moving, who's seconding and who's for and who's against. Um, and that's just a clear away and it's open to the public that way because they can't see the, the blue hand chat function. So that's a clear away. So uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome. And if we could just ask uh, Councillor Jo Tilsley if she could open uh, with a karakia. Thank you, Mia Toby. <clears throat> kia to te rangi marie, kia whakapapa paunamu te moana, hei hua rahi mā tātou e te rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou e te tātou katoa, huie taiki. Thank you, Joe. That was um, that was beautiful. Well done. So we'll just call for apologies. Uh, the only apology I have so far is for Ross Harris for, for lateness. Um, he's just having internet connection issues, so I, I think he's frantically working that out. Can I just have someone please move the apology for lateness for Ross Harris? Thank you, Councillor Anne Marie Spicer. Thank you, Joe Tilsley. All those in favour, please say aye. Against. Carried. So declarations of late items. I have no knowledge of any late items. Declarations of interest. No declarations of interest. We'll move on to the uh, council minutes from the 29th of the 4th, 2020. Somebody moved that those are true and accurate recordings of the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Councillor Smeaton. All those in favour? Against carried. So just going through matters arising out of there, uh, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, ten, 11, 12, 13, this will take a while, sorry guys, 14, 15, 16, 17. Oh. Good. Yeah, there's 87 pages, I apologise for that. Duncan. Um, just a little detail, uh, I noticed on page 13, if, um, if you just find it. I, I had a query there under refuse collection targeted rate and the annual charges for district collected. Is, is that a charge that applies to every rate payer, that $33.84? Can, can someone tell me that or answer it later maybe if you'd rather? So the district collected is anyone who receives a refuse collection um, service uh, from the Heritage Council. So generally our urban or residential areas. So it's in every property that receives that um, service. So, so if you don't get that service, you don't get charged? It. You don't get charged. And the reason that it's um, separated from Whutatoa is that Whutatoa during the um, summer peak season has extra collections provided um, because of the extra refuse created there. Um, during that sort of peak influx of people. And uh, so they pay for that additional level of service. Yeah. So the main thing I was interested in is to make sure it's, it's not charged to every rate payer. That's all right, thank you. Councillors, do you wanna go through this page by page or has anybody got any particular questions in regards to the items? I didn't think so. I don't think we need to go through 87 pages. Um, so fair enough. Councillor Broad. Just need to unmute their... Uh... Sorry, yeah, now I've got it. I pushed the wrong button, sorry, Mia Toby. Uh, page 34, under the Forikawa Coast, um, I did request that um, <clears throat> it went on record that I uh, didn't support the name change, and I see it's not there, but I do notice that Councillor Harris's endorsement of the name change is there, so I'd like that included um, within the minutes.
the time, we can we can add that. I can add that. Um, I didn't recall you wanting it recorded, but that's fine. I can record that if you like. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Gentle, did you have a question? Yes, thank you, um, Mayor Toby. Uh, I'm sort of more looking at the economic development report, and I don't know whether we should bring that up now or bring that up when Ross is here. Um, your call on that just had a couple of questions in regard to that. Uh, we'll, we'll try and hope for, for Ross to be here for that, but we're moving into the economic development report uh, next after we've gone through the, through the council minutes. Is there any other question on the council minutes? That being said, we'll move on to our economic development report. In the absence of uh, Councillor Harris being uh, not available at this stage, I'll move that we receive the report and over seconder. Thank you, Councillor Sarah Howell. All those in favour? Against carried. Morning, David. Uh, uh, David Varco, will you be taking us through this report? Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Worship Mayor and Councillors. Yes, I will. Um, the uh, report, of course, is from the Economic Development Department and it's just uh, in, indicating on what is what activities are happening within that area. Um, of course, the main content is the COVID-19 at the moment and the current economic uh, landscape. Uh, just to give you a, a brief rundown, Te Waka um, from Hamilton are taking a lead across the Waikato region as council staff have been working with them um, along with uh, informing the uh, Hauraki businesses uh, how to uh, locate Tiwaka services. Um, from, a, from a local business standpoint, um, David and Rebecca have been working closely with the, with the businesses. Uh, there is uh, a mixed uh, view right across. Plumbers are busy, um, builders are busy, the electricians are busy, um, and some of the uh, retail businesses are busy. He is doing a drive around the district, that is David, uh, tomorrow, and we'll get an indication of once level two is up and running on how the uh, retail sector looks. Um, further down, Love Hauraki has been launched um, and has had, uh, has had good success. Um, the, there has been also a business bites done through Zoom uh, there were 38 uh, participants on that and that went well. Uh, they have been working with the tourism sector and looking at uh, tourist operators um, setting up uh, uh, cluster um, packages as well for, um, for the tourism sector coming through. So uh, been quite busy in that space. Um, if you'd like to ask any questions, I'll endeavour to answer them for you. Just before you do, Brian, um, Councillor Harris, did you want to just add anything to that report? Uh, not at the moment, uh, Mayor Toby. I've just managed to uh, connect. <coughs> yeah, to, to add something, just some comments. Uh, I haven't heard exactly what uh, David Varco has uh, uh, presented, uh, but the report itself uh, is fairly self-explanatory. Really, really impressed with the way in which uh, the communication team, town promoters, uh, David, Rebecca, that team is working together. You talked, uh, Mia Toby, some time ago about co collaboration and working together. That is certainly uh, happening. Uh, and I think a lot of the work that's been done around uh, love hierarchy, uh, whilst it was uh, completed for a specific purpose uh, coming out of COVID-19, um, I think it will be a legacy uh, document that we will build on uh, heading into the future. The little group that uh, Rebecca has driven uh, regarding tourism uh, is, is uh, synonymous with, with working in collaboration. Um, I just think we're in a good space at the moment with that team and it's working very, very well. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ross. So, uh, Councillor Gentle, I've we'll got questions from you first, and then I've got um, Councillor Milner, Deputy Mayor Milner, and Councillor Broad. 
Okay, thank you, Mayor Toby. Um, just in regard to the economic development report itself, um, I'd just like to get more information. I don't know whether I've missed meetings or what have you, but um, what's been coming through to me, I think, is mainly what's been coming going out to the public. Um, perhaps I've missed something. Um, Destination Coromandel, um, they've obviously changed their angle, but they may be looking at uh, realigning that again with the perhaps bubble with Australia as well being included. So perhaps a little bit of in, um, uh, external rather than just internal uh, tourism. Uh, the industry newsletters would be good to get those too. Uh, Destination Coromandel, Haraki Rail Trail Charitable Trust, Wai Eyesight, that meeting there on page 42, I'd be keen to get uh, information on that, uh, just to be included if I can, to be kept up to date. And just in regard to the working group, um, will we have representation? Well, are we looking at the four well-being areas, economic, cultural, social, and environmental in that? To me, it's pretty important. Uh, certainly are, and that's, uh, I mean, that's mandated. It doesn't matter what, what, what we look at, we're always looking at those well-beings. So whatever decision we make uh, should come across those four well-beings. And probably apologies, um, because we haven't had a, an economic development or a community growth meeting, sorry, since we've been in um, uh, lockdown uh, within our bubbles. Um, and there has been um, a, a number of meetings that have taken place, and it's mainly been run by the chair. Um, but yeah, I reach out to, to Councillor Ross Harris and, and maybe the rest of the community growth meeting can be a part of those um, going forward. So apologies for that, Brian. Councillor Deputy Mayor Milner. Thank you, Mayor Toby. Uh, my question for David was just regarding the Business Bite Zoom meeting. There was um, 30, nearly 40 people attended that, so that was good, but where might somebody find that that wasn't able to attend on the day, please? Uh, through the Mayor, um, Councillor Milner, I will provide, uh, get Rebecca to provide you that information. Thank you. I just see there's a number 30 odd people watching us now, so I'm, I'm sure some of them might be interested. It sounded like it was quite successful, so that'd be good if we could push that out on the Facebook and Council website too. Thanks. Councillor Brown. Uh, thanks, Mayor Toby. Yeah, my question was as much the same. The numbers that attended the How to Shine, so that's been answered. Um, and yeah, the, the follow-up information, because I had, when we did our request to different businesses for information, there was a number that requested um, how to get on get online. I did make contact back with them and advise them to attend that meeting, so I'm going to do a follow-up with them, but I just wanted some information um, going forward, so thank you. Councillor Gentle, have you got another question? Yes, we don't mind, uh, Mayor Toby. Just wanted to ask in regard to um, Love Haraki, why didn't we put it on our own website rather than direct people away from that? Could we not have made it a page on our website? So, and uh, I mean, joe has been, uh, I don't want, to, don't want to speak for Councillor Joe, but she's been working tirelessly on that. To get something uh, as a separate website is a uh, far quicker uh, option than um, generally going through uh, our website and our IT team. I've been working remotely on all sorts of stuff um, and it was just something to do within haste. So there will be a link off our website that'll direct straight onto there. So that's something we're looking at, um, along with some other stuff that uh, Councillor Anne-Marie Spice has been going with around. It's not okay and um, helping people. So we try to get those links on our website. So if they do go there, they can just link off to them. Right, uh, and just a quick one. I, I know, Ross, you won't have the answer to this, but perhaps we can get together or touch base somehow. Uh, that's not getting together until we get to level two. Um, you asked, I think, back in February for David to give you a rundown, David Fielden, of the um, projects, uh, what he's doing at the moment, and it didn't actually come to the next meeting. Um, can we get that into the next economic development meeting? So the next, you, the next meeting oh, is going to be a, a workshop. So we're going to have a workshop that all councillors have been um, uh, invited to, and it's quite timely. Um, it was on the books to go through a workshop with our Community Growth Committee and our Social um, Strategy Working Committee, um, because the two are, are, are so aligned, um, but also with, with COVID going forward, um, it's we really need to look at what we're doing and how we can best do it to, to benefit all our ratepayers and all our businesses and all our community groups. So there's a lot of work going on with that. That's that's possibly why, um, that's not possibly why, that's uh, definitely why there hasn't been a meeting as such, because uh, we know that things are gonna change. COVID has thrown a spin amongst a, a lot of things um, and the way that people, uh, the way that council will operate, the way that businesses will operate and the way that community groups will operate. Um, 
it'll be different and it could be different for a long time. The, um, the real, I mean, there's some real talk, um, and I don't want to put a downer on there, but um, I mean, the recession that we had in 2008 um, was tough, um, but I think we're going to be in an, uh, another type of recession uh, through this COVID process. Um, our farming sector has definitely done it tough. Um, and when the two are down, when the when our business community, when our farming sector are, are both down at the same time, that's going to have a real effect. Um, so we've got to come up with some real initiative ways of thinking to really get our business economy going and keeping jobs going within our district. So that's where that work is happening at the moment, Brian. Any other questions? So I haven't got a question, but I just want to um, say, because I've, I've, I've tried to get to most of them, um, even though we're um, apparently at home um, in our safety, um, we are working just as hard as we were as when we were in the office um, and meetings are one after the other and we've been working uh, locally, um, sub-regionally and regionally to, to get the better, um, better outcomes for our communities. But that, that groups that have come forward now with our town promoters and our information centers and working collaboratively, um, is absolutely awesome. Uh, they're really starting to to, do, to, to to gel and get on with things. Um, so big hats off to, to Ross and also Councillor Paul Anderson. Um, he's been playing a huge part in that and getting those groups together. And um, it'll just make for a smoother process when it comes time to have that workshop. So I just want to thank, thank everyone that's been involved so far. Okay, so our next report, Community Initiatives. And Councillor Tilsley, are you happy to move that receiver report? Thank you. Can I have a seconder? Thank you, Anne-Marie. All those in favour, please say aye. Gains carried. David Varco or Steve Fabish, which of you would like to take us through this one? Um, thank you, Mayor Toby. I will um, continue with this. Uh, again, this is the, uh, the community initiatives report for May. Um, considering we only had a council meeting <laughs> two weeks ago, there's not a lot um, other else to um, offer. Um, just going through it, um, the only changes are that a um, grant was awarded through to, as of last council meeting, was awarded through to Thames Valley Hockey. Um, that has been asterisked um, as requested in the report. Um, that was for $20,000 for the LED lighting out there. Um, pretty much as per last report. Um, so if you have any questions on that, um, I'll take those. Questions, I'll go Councillor Harris. Thank you, Mayor Toby. Uh, David, have uh, the, 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 the trust uh, been advised of the success of that application? Um, through the Mayor, uh, Councillor Harris, yes, um, Julie Stevenson was, um, was advised um, just after the council meeting. Councillor Gentle. Thanks, Mayor Toby. Um, the District Social Strategy Fund, the Arts Navigator Creative Waiheke uh, Trust, can I get a bit of a background to that? Who is it? What is it? How are they chosen? And um, I think last time we had a council meeting, and that's not going to happen today, but I still would like to hear um, a bit of an in-depth report from the Haraki Citizens Advice Bureau. Uh, have the numbers gone up, gone down? What sort of people are inquiring, especially with um, COVID-19, things may have changed. It'd just be good to get a bit more in depth there. And can somebody tell me a bit more, I'm sorry, about a friend's place? Thank you. Councillor Anne-Marie, I'm sure you've got answers to um, the friend's place and probably the um, creative um, arts. And with the um, Citizens Advice Bureau, um, we'll, we'll just reach out to them um, and, and see where they're at and uh, put it in their court, because I know they will have a, a busy, busy time ahead of them and um, we'll just see where they can come in. Um, so with A Friend's Place, this is an initiative that uh, is currently being run at Waihi Beach and it's for uh, older residents uh, and they have about four events each week um, on four days where people can come along and do various activities. Uh, these are people that are 
often living alone, they're picked up, they're able to, to socialize with other people. And it was a really good initiative that's been well run uh, for quite a long time now by a woman called Trudy Van Stee. And she approached council wanting to set something up in Waihee. And she um, alerted council to the fact that there is a fund that we can apply to through the Ministry of Social Development. So with her, we worked on a, an application form and offered to put in $5,000 uh, from the social strategy fund uh, and applied for $5,000 through the Ministry of Social Development Fund to do a feasibility study on getting something similar up in Waihee. We felt there was a real need for it. However, that project is currently on hold um, because Trudy, who was keen to run this project, has decided to focus primarily on Waihee Beach at the moment because of um, various time constraints. So uh, I'm not quite sure where we're going to go with that. That's something that we need to discuss as a social strategy team, possibly use the funding and do the feasibility study and see if we can get someone else to run something here in Waihi. The idea is that it's a template that we can then push out to Pairoa, to the plains and elsewhere um, within the sort of area as well. So it's a work in progress, Brian. Um, and as far as the creative Waikato Trust came, they came and presented to us last year. Um, uh, we give them $2,000. There are workshops available, supports available for arts people. And I'm not sure, Joe, I'm not sure if you're, in the, if you're aware if that funding um, helps with the Creative Communities Scheme or not. Or maybe Katie, if she's listening, can tell us. Do you know, sorry, Joe, do you, do you know if that funding helps with the Creative uh, No, I'm unaware. I'll have to do some research. Steve, are you able to fill us in on that? Um, no, Katie, are you able to come in online for that one? She may not be there. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of um, the Arts Navigator, it's we've given them funding to um, put together a almost like a network of um, community groups within the Hauraki district um, so that we have a better idea of how we can help um, the community, the arts community within Hauraki. So that's an ongoing project um, and I can get a little bit more information to Councillor Gentle in terms of um, how, what the progress is on that currently. Thank you, Katie. And just while I've got the microphone, thanks to Katie for putting the asterisks and also the listing of the, the, the new fundings at the bottom. It just makes it a wee bit clearer, well, for me anyway. You're welcome. I just <laughs> didn't sound like Katie at all, but you're welcome. Uh, another initiative that's coming out, and we did have a discussion on that. I don't know if you just want to give us a little update, um, Councillor Filsley, on the elephant in the paddock and where we're looking to go with that. I think that's quite timely in, in regards to some of the concerns we've got out there in the community. Thank you, Mayor Toby. Um, elephant in the Paddock was initially launched four years ago in the Plains, and it was specifically designed to target our rural communities, farmers in particular, who uh, who struggle um, and continue to struggle with uh, good mental health. Um, of course, now we find ourselves in a drought situation, chuck in COVID for good measure, um, and our rural community is in a whole heap of hurt all over again, as is uh, the rest of our communities. Because Elephant in the Paddock was so successful first time around, uh, we are looking at rolling it out again, um, but right across the district this time. Um, so it'll be a refresh of the information, make sure that the contact details are relevant. We're looking to get um, local rural families to front this, to talk about the, the devastating effects that uh, mental health can have on our wider communities. Um, and we're also looking to uh, try and get it out in our, through our wider communities uh, in different ways, uh, get more agencies on board. Um, so we're hoping to have a Zoom either at the end of this week or the beginning of next week uh, with the agencies that partnered with Council the first time around. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that everybody's happy to jump on board with us again, um, and, and then we'll just get to it. Awesome, thanks. And I think it's quite important that we that uh, we branch that out to to everybody within our communities and make them aware of it. Um, we were showing a graph right at the start through civil defence on what what COVID was going to look like as far as um, as a process going forward with people's well-being. 
um, and there, there was a, a right of ramp up to the honeymoon period, which we could see. And um, you can see it quite clearly uh, out there in the community. Um, uh, when you talk to people, emails coming through, uh, and even the old Facebook pages, um, the honeymoon period where people were positive, um, people were helpful, people were thinking about others. Um, and then quite clearly on that graph, it just showed a massive drop um, as we come out of that. And uh, we start to see that already. And it's, it, you can see that some of that compassion has already gone um, and negativity is creeping back into to where it was. And that on top of um, what everyone's going through just has an effect on everybody. And you, you've got to be mindful that we are in a drought and we can't forget the, the farming sector that they've probably, um, I, I might be corrected if I'm wrong, but um, Philip, you'd know more, but I think this is just about the worst drought on recorded history um, that our farming sector's having to go through. Um, so they've been doing it tough for a long time as well. Um, the the COVID-19 hasn't helped with businesses having to shut down, um, but a lot of businesses that we've been talking to are okay at this stage. Um, it's what it's gonna look like coming out of that and going forward in the next the next couple of weeks and the next month or two. Uh, and also Nati with our main street, um, that's had an effect. They didn't get the best lead in time, um, but we, we, I mean, we just gotta get on with it and do our best and then just make sure that we've got systems in place to, to help all those um, struggling communities. So I think that's an awesome initiative. Is there any other questions on the um, that report? Okay, we'll move on to our uh, recreation report. Councillor Wilkinson, are you happy to move that we receive the report? Thank you. Can I have a seconder? Thank you, Ray. All those in favour, please say aye or wave your hand actually. Any against? Carried. We're back to you, David, are we? Yes, good morning, Worship Mayor. Got to and say, you're uh, looking sharp with that beard, mate. It looks a lot better than the old moustache you were sporting last week, last council meeting. Thank you, yes, it's grown in well. Um, uh, this is the uh, Community Recreation Monthly Report for May 2020. Um, I'll run through it. Um, district libraries, it, as a result, it, of course, as a result of COVID-19, the, the libraries have been closed for level four and level three. They will be uh, opening on the 18th. A uh, quick update on that. Um, limited hours from 10 through to one, Monday to Friday and uh, Saturday, uh, 10 through to, uh, through to 12. If you've got any questions, I'll take those at the end. Um, the APNK Wi-Fi uh, has been switched back on. Um, that enables um, our, re our residents, if needing free Wi-Fi, to, to work at the count at, at the outside the libraries. We do have social distancing um, X's on the ground, enabling people to utilise that. Um, the monthly newsletter has been going out. Uh, Facebook posts have, have been have been good. There has been an increase in online activity during COVID-19 um, and of course a decrease in activity around the around the library. Um, they are going through getting ready um, at present for the opening of the libraries. Um, there will be a large return of items. There's 5,000 items out at the moment. They have been recommended to be uh, quarantined for 72 hours um, before they go back on the shelves. Um, hence why we're doing reduced hours. Um, we also have new material coming in from James Bennett as well that has been sitting on the dock and that will have to be processed. Um, it, is the the trends are showing um, the ebook issues um, so quite a substantial jump in the ebook during the COVID period uh, and online memberships are a slight drop um, compared to last last uh, last year but a high increase in March and then it shows you the uh, the the e-platform top titles and web stats, uh, nothing to um, mention about the district pools due to the fact that they were closed. Um, going through the capital, the, the uh, capital projects, occurring a hack uh, reserve development, we have received 
uh, a couple of suppliers giving us specs on those and are at present looking at the um, previous people that they have worked with to uh, to get an understanding if there is any technical issues once those toilets have been installed and we should have a uh, answer on that in the next couple of weeks once things get back to normal um, and then the um, I passed on information about the decorative lighting in Pyro to Councillor Milner around the savings um, of combining the pruning as well as the lights um, under one traffic management plan. We did save a fee, the traffic, a single traffic management fee on that. Um, Dudding reserve is completed. Uh, we will be looking at some planting around the outside. Um, boundary of that uh, this coming winter and planting season. Victoria Playground, um, that equipment was on the on a boat waiting to come from China. Um, it's still scheduled to be installed in uh, June. And same with Gilmore Lake um, Playground surface. Um, in general, uh, after lockdown three, was announced the, the gardening and maintenance crews got back into work um, and have um, processed number one field in Pyroar. So that's been renovated, which is a, a, a yearly occurrence of under sowing, fertilizing, and then verda draining, which is just your drainage. Um, annual plants are going back into the gardens, and we have been working with. Um, sporting groups getting the facilities ready um, if they need them. Uh, level two, uh, just an update on level two, um, all playgrounds and parks will be open. There will be messaging, COVID-19 uh, level two messaging throughout um, and a, a strong emphasis on personal hygiene. The playgrounds and park assets have gone through, have been 30 second, um, as well as a um, disinfectant applied with that. But the strong messaging is around, uh, right throughout the industry, is around um, personal hygiene when utilising those facilities. Um, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll take those now. There's a couple of questions come up, but just, just one from me, David. With the sporting clubs, do you know which sports will be operating under level two? Have you had any inkling as to whether hockey or rugby or um, netball will be trying to operate? Yeah, there, ha there, there has been whispers out there that the teams will start to um, do some training under the guidelines of level two. Um, with the with the uh, groups being at a limit of 10, I'm not sure how they're going to do that. Um, there was a uh, Zoom conference with sector leaders and parks held last last week, and one of the main comments that came out around was, "Who am I? Who am I keen to sweat with?" Was the terminology. Um, so I think the sports clubs will be closely looking at how they're actually going to engage in the, the physical activity. Um, at this stage, I would imagine they would be um, um, spread across the park just doing personal fitness. So you said sweat, eh? Sweat. Who are you wanting to sweat with? Yeah. <laughs> would have gone either way. Councillor, Deputy Mayor Milner. Thank you, Mayor Toby. Um, a couple of things, or several things, but I'll just go with the first couple. Um, the APNK have been switched off. I can understand the reasons that was done and it was totally outside our control, but that um, put a bit of strain on some of our community that doesn't otherwise have access to the internet and that information that was critical for them to receive, they then didn't receive. And you could see that in the way people were sort of still out and about doing things for the initial period until that message got through. So in, in future, if there was something like this or some reason that thing had to be taken down, it'd be good to have some sort of backup there that we can get the message out to people. Um, I mean, newspapers were gone, so people relied on Facebook and the internet, and then that was taken away for a period of time until an alternative was sourced for them. So that was a shame. And my question was around the hours for the library. It says possibility are reduced to adjust for hygiene practices. I wondered if in the first week or, or certainly a few days, it might be worth having, if anything, extended hours to allow people to drop off their old books and get something new. They've been hanging out for six or seven weeks for some new material 
and I wonder if it might create a bit of a bottleneck. Everybody will rush down there at half past nine and queue up for, for an hour to get in the library. And I wonder if maybe extending that out, even if it's a day or two, let people know, and then they've got a fair chance to get in without causing any issues with congestion. Um, through you, Mayor Toby, um, Councillor Milner, yes, there has been um, considerable conversation uh, region-wise around library hours. Um, we were going to be opening on the 25th um, due to the, the influx of book return and the need for, for quarantine, um, but we've we adjusted yesterday uh, with further conversation and we had introduced some um, COVID um, programs like click and collect and bulk deliveries and stuff like that. So we've eliminated those to, to focus on core service. Um, and, and by doing that, we're enabling ourselves to open up on the 18th. Um, the, main, the main reason for the short hours is due to the fact that with that 5,200 items coming back, um, it's just staff being able to process those items um, as well as limited, and we're only limiting uh, 20 people in the library at a time, 30 minutes per person, so everybody gets a, um, a, a fair share of, of, of a crack at a, at a book. Um, staff have also been, uh, this week, have been reaching out to library users on uh, genres and uh, information that they, that they would like and will be able to direct the public coming through to those areas but um, do understand that um, we you know we, we would like to extend those hours but we have actually um, gone out earlier than other um, areas within our within our region um, on the APNK yeah it was a disappointment that that got turned off um, because we did have um, at that stage, a lot of freedom campers in the area that were also utilising that free Wi-Fi. Um, staff are looking at options for that, but I understand it is quite expensive. Councillor Gentle. Thank you, Mayor Toby. Um, just uh, to let you know, Paul, um, I've been working for over 50 days on radio. It was another way of people keeping up to date, and TV was out there as well, rather than just Facebook and the internet. So they do have other options there. Um, you mentioned the skate park being closed at the moment. Waihees has been open for about two weeks now with people uh, skating away. And I don't think it's just one family either. So hopefully level two, we may see some legal skating going on there. A couple of quick questions if I can, please. Victoria Park Playground. Um, I did the sums on the figures that are sitting in the right hand corner there. I haven't quite added up to the 137,500. There seems to be 15 grand difference. Uh, perhaps I've missed something there. And with the um, key projects and the recreation, the pyro lighting and being combined, is that the reason it went over budget? Because it also, mind you, you saved money because you only did the one road closure. I'm just wondering why it went over budget. Uh, through you, Mayor Toby, um, Councillor Gentle. Um, Duncan might better provide us a little more information around Victoria Playground upgrade due to the fact that there is um, additional um, funders out there providing for that. Um, around the, um, the pyro lighting and going over budget on that, I've done a little bit of research on that. Previously, the original um, scope of the project was for Christmas lights um, and they were to be installed and taken down in the Christmas period. I understand um, pre my time that it was a decision was made around a, a lighting system that could be put up that would uh, remain up um, and due to that decision that the uh, that went above the budget. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. And um, Councillor Smeaton, have you any more information just around the, the um, funders for the Victoria Playground upgrade? Um, thank you, David. Um, yeah, well, I haven't been close to the budgeting figures on that project for quite a long time because nothing much has happened for ages. But uh, my recollection is that uh, we're very close to our target funding requirements for that project. And um, I think the position at this stage is uh, we'll kind of cross the deficit bridge when we come to it. Uh, let's get this stuff installed. I'm actually very heartened to hear 
David, um, that you're proposing to install that equipment in June. So um, grab me a stretcher so I can fall over and get carted off if it actually does happen. So I'll be, uh, it'll be, be great if it does. And um, I've actually got some other questions, Mayor Toby, if I can ask them at some point. You can you can ask them now, unless I can see Anne Marie's waving her hand. If, as, if, as in regards to what, um, okay, we'll go. Let Anne Marie answer that, and then we'll come back to you, Duncan, please. Just just for Councillor Gentle's question, I think that fifteen thousand dollars that's missing is the Lions Club contribution because that's not listed in that column, and it perhaps should be. So I hope that helps answer your question, Councillor Gentle. Yeah, well, we'll do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, th thank you for that. Just just before I, I turn the mic off, um, I thought the, the uh, Lions had 45 grand, but um, you may know because you're a Lion and I'm not. Um, just going back to the, the overspend on, on the pyro lighting, where's the extra coming from? So those, those projects, um, and I get your concern, um, but th and those are ward-based projects, so that'll come out of a, um, the pyro ward um rates not don't don't panic why he aren't paying for those it's not a district function no different than um so playgrounds are a bit different they have a district wide to it but um particular particular town projects or ward projects are funded by ward rates and councillor Milner might have a he's got a question there. he was the ward chair at the time so he might be best to answer that I just put a comment on there regarding the, the pyro lights. The approved budget is 15,000, and the current forecast in the report is also 15,000, which is not over. So I'm not sure where the over is going to come from or what, what that's made up of. I get comment, Mayor Toby. I'm, I'm not sure you can comment on that one, but can you? That's, we're, we're still talk, yeah. talking about the lights and pyro. Yeah, that was pyro yeah. light. Sorry, Duncan, not the YHE 15,000. Yeah. David? I can comment further on the um, Victoria Park very briefly. We'll, we'll come to that in a minute, um, Duncan. Right. We'll, just, we'll just clear this one off. David or Duncan, can you can you answer the um, the budget items? There, there uh, through you, Mayor Toby, uh, there is an additional invoice still to process on the um, on the pyro lighting system. So the, the, the additional number should be it should have been reflected in the in the forecast um, total extent. So that was obviously just got missed from there. Sorry. So we get that um, clarified for the so that when it next comes up, you can see what the over is. You don't actually know what the over is. We might not be talking that much. So far, it's looks like it's on budget. So now we'll come back to you, Councillor um, Duncan Smeaton. So just uh, finishing off on Victoria Park, um, the Lions contribution to Victoria Park appears to be greater than 15,000 because they applied for some of the funding themselves. It's just a kind of an administrative um, way of doing things, if you like, that council applied for some of the funding for that project and Wahi Lions applied for some of the funding for that project. It's all to do with um, the way you have to apply for funds depending on whether you own the asset or not. And council owns the Victoria Park asset. And so that's why they applied for some of the funding. I don't see any point in going further down into that one there because it's kind of irrelevant. Not that uh, Councillor Gentle's question was irrelevant, of course, it was very important. But can I ask another question now on a different, on a related but different topic, Mayor Toby? You, you may. Um, I'm interested in uh, comments from David Varco about uh, you know opening the playground equipment and that kind of thing. It'd be it's. It'd be really interesting or it'd be, be good to get into perspective the various risks that are involved. For example, I suspect that um, it'd be quite a lot safer for me to go to the supermarket than it would be to spend all day attending a face-to-face -face council meeting. I've read an interesting article this morning that COVID-19 likes crowds like um, a rugby after-match function where we're all in a crowded room uh, having drinks and there's a hundred of us in there versus uh, going to the supermarket, even though there might be 100 people in the supermarket, I'm only there for half an hour or an hour and I'm well spaced from other people. And I think that like the playground equipment, for example, of course you wouldn't have a clue who's been playing with it and um, to assume that everyone's washing their hands before they use the gear, I think um, 
would be unwise. But need, needless to say, the risk of playing on playground equipment is probably very low because um, there's very few people, relatively speaking, using it and there's no crowding and that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's sometimes hard to get the different risks into perspective in terms of COVID-19. And uh, I don't know whether anyone wants to comment on that or not. Um, through you, Mayor Toby, uh, Councillor Smeaton, uh, Smeaton, there has been um, considerable conversation throughout the industry um, in the last few days around playgrounds, dog parks, parks in general, um, even the, to the extent of in, installing hand sanitizer equipment right through all our parks and playgrounds. Um, there has been con uh, uh, agreed um, that not to do that. Um, but to actually enforce the messaging around personal hygiene and parental responsibility on um, ensuring that the children that are using the equipment um, are, are, are practicing that, uh, that personal hygiene. On a note, just on Hauraki, we, we um, are zero uh, cases at present, so uh, we're lucky in that standpoint. Deputy Mayor Milner. Yeah, just a question and a comment regarding the skate parks. I, everything was closed, we all understand that, but closing it with a bit of plastic tape was totally ineffectual. And I think Councillor Gent will back that up. What he saw and why he was pretty similar to what I saw in Pyrrhal. And about five weeks after lockdown, all of a sudden we had a sign appear on one of the skate parks in Pyrrhal, which was totally useless because the um, plastic tape was flapping all around it and people were skating away merrily. So. In future, we need to have something a bit more substantial, like a, a wire rope or something, because the plastic tape, you just jump it and off you go. So it was it was a nice idea, but it was probably a waste of money putting signs up if there was no physical barrier. If I could, could me, Toby, just a quick comment to follow up on Paul. Yeah, agreed, totally, because um, I think the skate parks are aiming at your teenagers, whereas the youngies going to the parks with their parents, uh, obviously had that direction um, and responsibility from the parents, whereas these are the youngies, um, too old for the parents, too young to go out on their own, but just um, gathering around the skate park, sadly. Thank you. Yeah, I think that happened uh, quite a lot all over the place, and uh, it was a common thread coming through from from mayors throughout, throughout the Waikato region, um, and, and police were inundated. I, I think the police actually struggled with powers at the start, to be honest, um, about what they could and could and could not enforce, um, so it did make it hard. And and for us to enforce it, then I suppose we've got to have someone sitting out there doing it, which was going against what everyone was trying to do, which was stay inside. So yeah, I get your point. And um, geez, hopefully we don't have another one of these coming soon. Councillor Broad, you had your hand up prior, but you've taken it down. Is your question being answered now? Cool, awesome. Is there any further questions in regards to that report? I think we're all happy. Let's go on to community facilities. Councillor Anne-Marie Spicer, are you happy to move that we receive the report? Thank you. Can I have a seconder? Thank you, Sarah Howell. All those in favour, please wave your hand vigorously. All those against, please hide your hand underneath the camera. No, I'm kidding. Motion carried. Well, David, you're back on again, mate. Thank you, Worship Mayor um, and Councillors. This is the uh, Community Facilities Report for May 2020. Again, very similar to uh, the other reports, not a lot of uh, movement um, with to report on. Um, nothing significant from the, uh, the, the elderly person's housing. Um, I do have an update on public toilets, water opening under level two. So we've had the um, the ones that were open during the, the whole level uh, four th and three um, via EOC request to keep them due to the fact that we're on State Highway 2. Uh, toilets opening, further toilets opening uh, will be Kaiawa for um, Waitakaruru, Tuarua, in Ngātio there'll be Orchard and Hugh Hayward, Pairo will be uh, Railway in Ahunamuri, and Waihi, Hazard, Victoria and Gilmore and Furutoa will be Budakawa and the Surf Club. Um, typically, these are clean 365 days a, a, a year. Uh, we will be doubling the cleaning during level two uh, for those toilets. I'm happy to take any questions at the end of the report on the toilets. 
rural halls, um, just guidelines have been uh, are going out in our community halls around um, uh, the level two, what is expected of um, 10 people only. That, uh, that messaging is on the rent forms uh, with the CSAs. Um, cemeteries, we had a little bit of a little bit of topsy turvy with um, new messaging coming out this week uh, from the 100 gathering down to the 10. So uh, a, a message had been sent through to all our funeral directors around the, the 100 that was uh, adjusted with another message out through to the 10. So just to clarify, council staff provide the um, the burial um, process of a funeral and the funeral directors um, are responsible for um, attendees track and trace. Uh, nothing to uh, report about the uh, non-rec reserves. Um, the projects are um, as the same as last uh, two weeks ago. No, nothing, no change there. Um, a little update on Puki Rimu Cemetery. The contractor has been back in there since level three, and that will look like uh, to be completed within the next couple of weeks, which is good. Uh, the new to Kaiawa toilets are in relation to the Karanga Haki toilets as well, and the Miranda Cemetery um, drainage um, project has been complete. Um, if you have any questions on that, I'll be happy to take them. Deputy Mayor Milner. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Toby. Um, just a question. I Could you go through the toilets that aren't open? And I noticed the pirate domain was on not listed, and I would suggest the domain toilet's more important than the Ohinamari Reserve because people will be back in the playgrounds, and we got a lot of feedback last time that we need that toilet to be open rather than one that's... Um, targeted at the traveling public, they can use the railway reserve. So perhaps not needing open and just yet if we can't open them all. Uh, through you, Mayor Toby. Um, thank you, Councillor Milner. We'll put that one on the list to be open as well. Councillor Spicer. Um, thank you, Mayor Toby. I just wanted to thank Desiree for the work she's continuing to do with our pensioners. Um, social isolation is obviously hitting those pensioners hard, and she's doing a very good job keeping in touch with them, making sure that they're okay. Uh, she dropped off happy packs a few weeks ago, which I didn't realise, to every pensioner, which had chocolate, fruit, Easter eggs in it. She keeps in touch with them. We've seen the newsletter. She's calling them. And I just wanted to acknowledge the hard work she's doing in that space and keeping tabs on them. It's really good. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Spicer. I'll pass that on to, to Desiree. Any further questions for David, Community Facilities? Adrian, I, you said at the start of the meeting you might have to um, vacate at 10 for a little bit. Are the next two reports under you? Do you want to um, do you want a break now and we come back so that you can present these or um, at Langley you'll be able to present them on uh, Adrian's behalf? I can present the Crown Infrastructure Fund. Um, the recycling is uh, really um, under Adrian's expertise. How long do you need, Adrian, for for you? Um... Um, Your Worship, if I could just have 10 minutes, that would be good. Um, so if we could reconvene for that at 10 past 10. Okay. okay. So just because it'll be, there's probably quite a few questions for the um, Crown Infrastructure one and, and with the, the plastics and it'll be handy to have Adrian here. So can I suggest um, we just break for a cup of tea now? It's 9.56 a.m. and we would be back ready to reconvene at uh, 10 past 10.
Oh, apologies for lateness this morning, Toby. Uh, we had major issues. Uh, no problem. That's uh, hope, hopefully you get your internet sorted. So um, we'll just wait for um, ten past ten to, to reconvene. But we are we are still live live out there to the world. So nobody uh, try not to remember that you got an itchy face. <laughs> <clears throat> Just getting through some of the many emails, man, they just oh. went through. <clears throat> So everybody's been keeping well just while we wait for Adrian. Everyone's everyone's coping well under the pressures. I know you've all been flat flat out uh, working. I know working from home's not as not that easy for everybody, but everyone's coping all right working from home. Toby, can you open up my video link, please? Yeah, I, I didn't think I could. I turned it off, to be honest. But um, when I click it, it says uh, cannot start because the host has stopped it. Oh, that's not me. I'm only a co-host. Okay. I'll, I'll give it a whirl. Sweet, thank you. Yep, I'm back. Oh. So, yep, I didn't have control because I did nothing. So apologies there. No, all good. Same with me, Toby. Yeah, I'm sure uh, it's either uh, Katie or Langley that's um, got the, the ultimate power of cameras. And uh... I'm the same as well. Here we all come. Thank you. Who's rushed out and supported their local coffee shop and bought a, bought a coffee since level three? I didn't mean right now. I didn't. I didn't expect you'd had time to go get a coffee now. But <clears throat> so, only waiting on Adrian. Did you want to make it start Langley on the? Um... Uh, Adrian's been back since. Oh, there you are. Sorry, yeah. sorry, my bad, Adrian. <laughs> I, I do apologise. Okay, so uh, page 62 of the agenda, uh, Crown Infrastructure Partners Funding. Uh, I'll move that we receive the report. Can I have a seconder, please? 
Thank you, Ross. All those in favour? Against carried. Welcome back, Adrian. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll take the report as read, um, and I did share it with the councillors um, uh, earlier this, uh, uh, last, late last month, just gave you a heads up that I had submitted for it. Um, so it's just to notify you formally that we, we have submitted for CRP funding application. On page two, um, it identifies the funding that we have, um, the bundle that we put together for the uh, funding. Um, so we are requesting funding for Natia Main Street Streetscape, uh, Power or Tourism Hub, as we're calling it, which is to finish off Wolf Street, Mackey Street, um, with the version we would like, not the version we can necessarily mm -hmm. afford at the moment. Um, accessibility, that five and a half million dollars is to create um, proper walking and linkages uh, through our community to create connected communities, um, uh, widening up our footpaths to, um, I think three meters is now the new standard for shared spaces and that. Um, and so um, it's that work. Car parks, there's two roads we've identified um, that would benefit from a car park in Maritola Valley Road. There's a whole lot of walking tracks off the end and there's nowhere to park at the end for people to access those. So we, we're looking at uh, getting a car park in there and then also upgrading the car park um, down at the Dickies Flat car park area and doing some road um, improvements down to uh, that Dickies Flat um, area. Cell extensions is looking at bringing some cell extensions into areas where we are seeing some growth and we've done some minor um, resealing just for dust, but to actually improve the quality of those roads to those areas where we are seeing some growth. So that, that is the bundle we have submitted to the government that came back, um, I think it was Monday last week and asked for us to supply some additional information by close of business on Monday, um, which I have provided um, and then um, I, my understanding now is that instead of notifying us in May, we're likely only to hear in mid-June as to whether we will uh, get additional or whether we will be successful in that funding. There are nearly 900 applications and some of them are many billions of dollars, so they've got a lot of um, work to go through to review all of that. In addition to this funding package, um, we have worked with the Waikato LAS um, and have submitted for some funding um, around uh, some work that we can get done that could be labor intensive and we can uh, train up local people um, and reskill them to be able to undertake those works. And that was a, that was a Waikato Less initiative that we took part in. And the other funding that we're likely to apply for um, if we're unsuccessful for this funding is a, they brought out a specific one for um, streets we were creating connected communities and that and we will likely apply for that in early July if we're unsuccessful in this funding but we're not allowed to have both packages in two different application funds so we we'll wait for the, us to get turned down or accepted for this one before we can move to the next one. Are there any questions? Questions, councillors? <clears throat> Councillor Daly? Adrian, the uh, Pyro Tourism Hub, the money that's allocated there, is that to finish um, Mackey Street? And what is going to be done to finish Mackey Street? Yes, so we have a program to finish Mackey Street, um, sort of cutting the cloth to fit our current budget, um, but it's not what we would like to do or what the ward has indicated that uh, the, the previous ward had indicated that they would like to do. So there's quite a lot of work that we could do. And when we did the original um, high level review of it, um, the there's a lot we can do in uh, Wall Street itself and then in Mackey Street we still need to sort out the intersection with the state highway and there was also some work that was being done um, in uh, Worms, I think it's Wormsley, uh, the one that runs parallel to the state highway um, by the domain. Um, originally there was quite, Willoughby, there was quite a bit of work that was going to be done in Willoughby but that got removed quite early on in the piece because of uh, funding 
and then also the entrance into the domain and all of that. So what we've done is, is that we've brought back all of those elements that we've had to withdraw because of lack of funding. Um, and also if the cycleway is, um, the Hiraki Rail Trail Trust is um, able to secure the funding that they've um, applied for, um, it's going to significantly increase the usage of the trail once they've under finished their works. Um, and that will really make that central area, Wolf Street, Mackie Street, a tourism hub. Um, because it's the spoke of all the different routes and so therefore this would hopefully um, be able to piggyback off of that um, and support that work. Uh, through you Mayor Toby, Adrian can we can the PAR award at one of their meetings have a um, an up, updated um, situation on all of that that we have just discussed if I could um, um, include you or somebody representing your area within uh, one of our power award meetings, which we have every week, um, just so that we're all um, up to date with all of those issues. Thank you. If you could just send me through a meeting invite, just forward the meeting invite to me, um, I'll get uh, Antoinette to work my calendar around it. Awesome. Thanks, Adrian. Councillor Smeaton. Uh, thank you, Mayor Toby. Um, Adrian, I see you've applied for three and a half million dollars worth for the Natia Main Street streetscape. That's that's not inclusive of the work that's currently going on there, is it? Because I'm sure. Can you just clarify that for me? Um, it is for some of the works, but um, we've still got that one and a half million dollars of co-funding. So we've indicated that we've got one and a half million dollars of co-funding. So this is to finish Natia Main Street with the option that we want that was originally looked at that was never going to be able to be uh, forwarded so it looks at um, doing quite a lot more than is currently um, planned um, and so it was sort of first prize that we never never went to because it um, the cost involved it was quite significant so they don't have any problem with you applying for funds for a project that you've or that you're already working on that's what they wanted was yeah, quite the project. Yep. Okay. So anything, they didn't want dream projects, they wanted stuff that was ready to go. So that is a particular one that is ready to go. And, and I'm hopeful, like if we could get any of them, that would be one that would be a, an absolute awesome one to get. Um, so there was some beautification on the top of the streets, which would have been some plantings and uh, new light poles and, and, and the like to really smarten it up. Um, but the, the consensus of that business community was to get the, their, their emphasis was on the curb and channel and, and the footpaths and getting that looking nice from one end to the other where the original budget only had half of the main street so the, the first half of the main street getting done so if we if we got that one that would that would help take some pressure off that community and um, lift their spirits but that's what i'm very keen on councillor harris thank you mayor toby adrian when you talk about seal extensions and you added uh, areas of growth in there at 5.2 million dollars have you got a list of those seal extensions i'm just assuming that uh, north road would be included um yes councillor Harris, we do have a list of them i don't i don't have the list um immediately available um but there's uh, two of the roads i do know there's 90 tangata road um, there's consideration of Dickie's flat. There is, um, oh, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't remember the full Cause... list, but there, there's a reasonably good, a decent list of roads that would benefit um, because of the growth. And North Road, I think, was one of those. Thank you. Councillor Broad. So, can't hear you, Councillor Broad. No, he's um, he's working on it. You can see him looking down at his keyboard. He's getting frustrated. We'll come back to you, Councillor Broad. Don't panic. We'll um, um, coordinate you right now. Thank you, Mayor Toby. There was just a problem with the space bar not uh, unmuting. So, um, thanks, Adrian. Um, we covered this off yesterday in a ward meeting with Haraki Plains. So, thank you for the work you've done and um, pushing this through and and putting Natia there to to get some funding it's really appreciated and I just want to acknowledge that um, I brought it up at the last council meeting it's a bit of an update and we've got a clear understanding exactly how this is working time frame so I'm really pleased that uh, we may have some good news and and move forward for the town thank you thank you councillor gentle 
Oh, sorry, Adrian, did you want to comment? Councillor Brian Gentle. Sorry, I was just waiting in case Adrian wanted to say something. Thank you, uh, Mayor Toby. Um, first of all, um, I just find it's quite an overview, I'm not saying where the footpaths or walkways, where the car parks are and those sorts of things. A, for us, I know that Adrian said because of resources and timeframes, it wasn't possible to present to the councillors. Um, but just in general, when we're putting this out and it's in the public arena, saying car parks and associated rural road improvements or... Um, I didn't even know we had a pyro tourism hub. I think it should be clarified too, uh, if I'm correct, that this is on top of uh, any other money. In other words, if we don't get this money, we go back to the original plan and the original dollars. So if um, anybody's watching or listening uh, from the ratepayers' viewpoint, this is not additional that uh, if we don't get it, we're still spending it, but it's coming out of their rates. So that's 100% correct. So as Adrian uh, alluded to, prior, a lot of these projects were stuff that had been pre-planned, but pulled out because of budget restraints. So um, that's why they were um, shovel-ready projects because work had been done um, to, to scope the job and to price the job. So um, government came out with a, with a wish list, uh, well, not a wish list, they came out and asked for a wish list um, of shovel-ready and shovel-worthy product projects that were ready to construct within the next six months, that you could physically start the works in the next six months. Mm -hmm. um, the time frame on getting those projects together was very limited um, and there was a lot of councils, uh, every council probably, um, that just had a list of projects that they've been worked on, communicated with the, the public in the past um, and had been pushed out because of funding options. So um, as, as Adrian said, we're down to uh, 900. I think it started at 1700. So they've already, they've already cut the axe through um, eight, eight, 900 of those projects already. Um, and some of those were because they know that they're not shovel ready or shovel worthy. And then they'll be going through these, these last um, 900 projects. But there's, there's a list of them. Um, there's only so much money to go around. Um, so uh, I think we'll be doing extremely well if we even get one of them. Um, so if we got one, we're doing better than a lot of councils. I can guarantee you that. Okay, well, I, I, I just, I just, I just like it recorded if I possibly could that I, I was disappointed um, that we weren't included or even been included since emailed, um, contacted somehow. Uh, I don't know whether shovel ready would, could include our water problem and why he. That to me doesn't seem to be going away, and I just jotted down probably half a dozen things that around this area could be possibly looked at to be included, whether they would be considered to be shovel ready or not. I'm not too sure, but. Um, you know, just being able to put the hand up and throw some ideas in there would have been good. Is it too late to actually add something, change something? I think just for Councillor Gentle, um, <laughs> this um, was something that was thrown out, um, and I think we had less than a week to respond. Mm -hmm. um, and um, if we were to try and put a waters project up, um, we would have had to brought in a team of perhaps 10 people um, to work on this. I know Talpo had 40 people working on their applications to the Crown Infrastructure Projects. Um, it would be great if we're successful in these. I think I'd just like to reiterate um, um, Mayor Toby's comment that um, there is an inordinate number of projects. Um, when it was originally put out, there was something, they gave an indication of $800 million worth of funding. Um, Hamilton City alone put in $200 million of funding. Um, so we have to balance um, how much effort we put in to put this in against the success of one of these going through. Um, we wouldn't have had time to have put the detail necessary to get even a, um, a remotely, um, I guess, accessible and feasible project around some of our waters. So we concentrated on what we thought was available. And I recall, I think about two weeks ago, Adrian had sent all this information out to councillors um, that you you're receiving today. So it's um, not correct that we haven't provided any information to councillors on this. Okay, well, I'll stand corrected on that, but I still think that it would have been good to have included a few other things. Um, and in between from when you first put the application in, you only had a week um, to be able to actually maybe contribute. Um, and I've spoken to a couple of other the, of the YHE councillors as well, and they seem to be of the same ilk. Uh, it's just disappointing, but um, I just wanted it to rec mm. be recorded. So the criteria, um, if I may, um, <clears throat> on page um, 68 of your agenda, um, the, it indicates the 
co with whether it's how much of the project's funded, how much isn't funded. But basically, and also I've indicated in the report that um, to the kind of infrastructure partners that we will only build the funded portion, we will not build the unfunded portion. So if you look at seal extensions, $5.5 million is unfunded and will not be built if we do not get funding for that. Um, in terms of uh, shovel already, we, we did consider, as, as Langley has indicated, um, a number of water projects and wastewater projects, but the criteria were very specific. And um, we tried everything we could, but it was kind of fitting a square peg into a round hole. Um, the project, the time frame that we had included Easter weekend, so um, there was two of us a fair bit of time pulling what we did submit together over that time to be able to submit it on the Tuesday straight after the Easter weekend. Unfortunately, the definition of sovereign already meant that they didn't want it incumbent with any resource consents or anything like that that might cause um, any holdups to the project. So we had to be able to be digging dirt within a couple of months. And, and so it, it, it excluded quite a few of the projects. So in Wahi, um, the cycle way through the, along the river route, for example, that will require um, consents. And so therefore we weren't able to um, put that project forward. Um, so it, 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 it was very, very tight criteria. So unfortunately there's a lot of things we would like to have and put a wish list through, but we just couldn't um, bundle them together. And there was also a minimum funding. It had to be more than a $10 million package of work. And so if we started putting cycle waste together and that type of thing, it wouldn't have met that $10 million criteria because it couldn't have been included in this, which is primarily a, a dealing with um, transportation and such like uh, road in. Hey, if, if I could, Mayor Toby, just before I, um, you move on, could I just ask for a bit more explanation in regard to the professional fees? They seem quite expensive at $2 million. No, professional fees are anywhere between 10 and 25% of a project cost, um, depending on the nature of the project. So um, that represents about 2% of the, just over 10% uh, of the cost of the overall project. So you're not you're not looking at them individually as 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 options. It's a total package that's gone through. So I think everybody needs to re read the report in full to get a full understanding of what is in that report, rather than picking out little bits of line by line. But the the the, um, the options or the paper that went to the ground infrastructure funds was for nineteen million four hundred and fifty thousand dollars as a project that was greater than ten million dollars, and those professional fees are in regards to that total $19 million. So that's that's standard. That doesn't matter what council you're with, that's gonna be there with everybody. As Adrian and Langley have said, we were given a, a week to, sh to throw these projects together, um, like a lolly scramble, no different than the PGF. Um, and some people are, are, are blessed to have an enormous amount of staff sitting around um, that are available to pull this together in a very short space of time. Future Proof was one of those, Auckland City, Christchurch, Wellington, um, Hamilton City, they've had projects that have been sitting there worked on throughout this time and it was um, it was pretty quick for them to be able to throw the report together, put a um, nice cover page on it and flip off within three or four days. So we weren't blessed with that at Hauraki. Um, so I, I want to thank Adrian um, and his team for what you have got through um, for us um, and hopefully that we do get something out of that. Um, but mindful that it's not a big uh, big lot of money and uh, it'll go to where the, where the populations are. So I wouldn't be too surprised if Auckland, Christchurch, Wellington, Hamilton don't suck up most of it, to be honest. Thanks, Mayor Toby. Thanks, Andrew and uh, Adrian. And uh, rest assured, I, I did read all the full report before I picked it to pieces. Bits and pieces, anyway. Councillor Harris. Thank you, Toby. Uh, everything that uh, you've said in the last uh, 40 seconds, 50 seconds, has covered off what I would believe need to be said as well. Councillor Broad, you've got your hand up. Uh, thanks, Mayor Toby. So <clears throat> can I just get clarification? This is a, a total application, so the government won't go through and handpick bits out of it. What you're saying is that it's either we get the lot or we get nothing, um, as I understand it. Is that correct? Um, uh, if, you, if you've got the crystal ball that can see into Minister's eyes, um, please allude us to that, because... Uh, like anything, we've we've been told that projects meet all the criteria for, um, and it's all got the green light, and then suddenly it doesn't. So I, we don't know, honestly. Nobody knows how they're going to divvy it up. 
Um, they, they might try and spread it right across the region and pick little bits out, um, or they might just lump it into big sums. So for them, it'll be about what's going to create um, great infrastructure for them and where they can get uh, employment and, and the economy going. That'll be how they determine the projects, I think. But I've got no idea, and I don't think anybody does. You know, it's exactly as uh, Mayor Toby has said, there's no, we, we don't know. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, no more questions. So let's not waste any more time and let's get right into our next um, report, which happens to be on waste. So Councillor Smeaton, you happy to move that we receive the report? Thank you. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Buckthorpe. All those in favour? Gains carried. Adrian, we welcome your input. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> I, know, I know this report is uh, not without controversy. Um, what I, we, we put together a report, and I apologize for the briefness of the report. The decision was made on Tuesday afternoon to put a report to count following a meeting of our neighboring councils. Um, to put a report to council on Wednesday morning, uh, and, and the agenda closed on Wednesday morning. So um, it was pulled together very quickly. Um, and while I had spoken to Councillor Smeaton about it, the timeframes just did not allow for Councillor Smeaton to be able to review the report initially. And so I, I have apologised to him for um, not the report up to him before we got it onto the agenda. Um, the We've been collecting plastics threes to sevens um, as part of our refuse collection um, since a National Sword was invoked by China when they um, correctly refused to um, become a dumping ground for the rest of the world um, to waste products. And um, the what it did, the, the effect of National Sword on the world, not just New Zealand, was um, kill the market for several products. Um, and plastics threes to seven types, threes to sevens were part of these plastics that were included um, in having the market for them removed. Initially, there were some markets around um, some of the emerging nations. Um, however, once people started investigating what was happening there, it was environmentally a disaster. And so we had continued to collect plastic sevens in the vain hope that there would be a market opening up and a really good way of using those opening up soon, but unfortunately that never eventuated. Um, and so we're now in the position we've um, been in lockdown with COVID and we're moving out of that. Our neighbouring councils have both made the decision and they're part of our overall contract um, to no longer collect plastics threes to sevens and um, they've gone out to the communities and notified their communities uh, today and on Monday of that decision. It's not a decision we as staff can make and so hence the need to get it um, before council um, as a matter of urgency. I have done a review um, across um, 14 different councils um, sort of from Auckland South, which I, I have emailed out. Sorry, I was doing it during the first part of this meeting. Just going through and having a really good look, um, following some questions I've received at who does what. And um, the, the only, there's very few councils that collect anything other than plastics ones and twos. Um, there's Waikato District does collect five and um, Waipa and Rotorua District Council um, collects, I put the other because it's a little bit vague and if you click on those links you'll, you'll see what I mean. They, they collect some plastics but not soft plastics and, and different components but they do specifically collect ones and twos and to collect the other plastics you've actually got to take it to, it's not part of the weekly collection, it's, you've got to take it to um, the transfer station or the recycling station. Um, Waipa and um, Waikato District Council are part of the um, group that's um, making those posts and that is collecting um, soft plastics um, through the countdown stores and that and um, 
we have approached them as indicated to the working party, the waste minimization working party on Monday, we have approached them to be able to collect those plastics and have a collection points set up at countdown. But at this stage, they are taking all the plastics they can from um, Auckland and from those councils. And so there's no, um, that they don't have the bandwidth to be able to offer us those services. They have indicated once they grow, um, they may be able to offer us that um, going forward. So um, of the 14 councils I reviewed this morning, which was um, all of the Waikato and Western Bay of Plenty, um, or not all of the Western Bay of Plenty, but some of it, um, majority of them have stopped collecting plastics um, ones and twos and some time back. Um, I've indicated that I would um, provide some information around the costs. Um, it hasn't been an easy process to identify those costs because we're in the process of moving from the one landfill contract to the other landfill contract. So the cost component that would make up the cost to us if we were to consider collecting them would be um, possibly a sorting cost at the MIRF, um, transport from the MIRF, to the landfill and the cost to dispose of it in the landfill. Because even if we consider, continue to collect plastic threes to seven, they are going to go to landfill. They will not be recycled. Um, the other, so, so it adds an additional cost onto us. Instead of going from the yellow bags to the landfill, they're gonna go from black bin to possibly be recycled, which is unlikely, to the landfill. If we do collect plastic threes to sevens, um, my gut feel is, and this is my view, personal view, is, is that um, it's not going to be commercially viable for the contractor to actually sort Horaki's um, waste when it's actually not a large volume. And the net effect is, is that it's likely to all end up in landfill plastics, ones, twos, threes, to sevens, because the cost of sorting those plastics is just going to be contaminated with the um, plastic threes, to sevens. Um, the um, volume of plastic at the start of the contract um, that they based the contract on was actually quite a small volume and I think overall as a total volume it still is a very small um, overall cost, uh, overall volume um, that these plastics um, uh, represent. So um, it's um, represents about, um, sorry, just, um, it's, it's about um, less than 10%, it's 5% of the total volume of recycling that is collected is um, these mixed plastics. Um, I'll take any questions. I'm expecting a, a flurry of little blue hands coming up, but I've got a waving one from Councillor Smeaton, so we'll go from uh, Councillor Smeaton first. I have to uh, manually wave my hand because I am uh, I just panic when I start trying to find the blue hand, you see, so I just have to do the old-fashioned way. Anyway, sorry. Adrian, did you get my email this morning? I sent to you kind of reinforcing uh, comments made by Councillor Milner that... Um, We've got to be real careful here to not look like we're just giving up on plastics three to seven. And I did ask you at the meeting the other day, and um, I'm asking it again, just to sort of record that we need to know, I think, what actually are we talking about plastics three to seven versus the total plastic pool and as against plastics one and two? You've given us the, you told us the volume of um, mixed plastics is less than 10 or 20% of the total recycling, but that still doesn't really tell us the kind of size of uh, plastics mm -hmm. three to seven versus plastics one and two. And I'm, I appreciate that the information is not easy to get, but I can't believe that someone somewhere hasn't done it. So there's, there's, there's two issues there, Adrian. How big a problem are we looking at? And secondly, um, I don't think we can just walk away from it and say, we tried our hardest, we, we can't do anything about it, we give up. So, um, Councillor Smeaton, I do have the numbers that the original contract was based on. Um, they are commercially sensitive, um, and as a result, um, I, if we were in committee, I could uh, share them with you, but unfortunately, we, we're not in committee, so um, I'd be really nervous about sharing those um, total vo uh, volumes uh, with you. But 
that's why I've indicated that it is 5% of the original total volume that the contract was based on. Um, so, or 5.2% of the total volume. So it is a very small volume that we are dealing with. Um, and the problem is not, um, the, the amount of that is not a huge um, dollar value. Um, it's not that we're giving up on it, but at the moment there is no commodity. And as you can see, um, all the councils across all the area that I looked at um, have taken a very similar approach um, to that. The it's yeah, so councils across the country would love to collect it, would love to be able to do that, but unfortunately, there's just no market for it. And if there's no market for it, it's refuse. Um, and you know, we can collect it, but it's going to go to landfill. There, there's just nothing that anybody can do with it at the moment. It's not whether we've given up on it or not. Can I, com can I comment again? Yeah, yep. for sure. Yeah, so. Uh, Adrian, are you and I going to look our grandchildren in the eye and say, sorry about this plastic, guys, we we just did our best and it didn't work, so sorry about that. Um, that's a wee bit unfair. <laughs> I, um, the, I think um, it's not that we did nothing about it, it's um, the world did nothing about it. And I don't think um, we've got capacity within Hodaki and us collecting, carrying on collecting plastics threes to sevens, um, knowing that it's going to just cost our community to do that and it's going to have the same results if we don't collect it as part of the recycling is, um, there's very little we can do about it, but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of work going and the, um, Wastemans, which is the industry body, is working with the um, Associate Minister of Environment, Eugenie Sage, and um, industry to try and come up with um, different ways in which to deal with these plastics. Um, plastics files, there are some products that uh, lines that can, that can be, but it's quite selective. Um, and that's why only two councils are collecting it in the area. Um, but it's it's not it, there's a lot of people in the industry doing a lot of work in that space and and the industry is also working with the minister about getting um stewardship in place so that the responsibility falls back on the packaging companies and the product companies to deal with it so to get out of its source rather than um by the users um so yeah Yeah, so good luck with your grandkids there, Duncan. But um, I, I did. I also did an extensive amount of research um, on all the councils, um, and that was that's Google. That's what you can do when you're safely in your bubble. Um, spend time on your computer. And the only council that I could seem to find that was doing anything with products um, three to seven was uh, Wellington City. Wellington City obviously have a market where they can send their products off to get pellets um, turned into pellets and then made into to other products. The other question is whether we can, um, and before I go to everyone else, sorry, is whether, because um, something will come out of it at some point. I mean, we've all got the option of not buying those products. That, that eliminates it, and then we don't have to recycle them. Or is, can they can they be, um, if they are sent to landfill, can they be sent to landfill uh, on their own in a, in a different area so they're not contaminated with other stuff so that they could be later mined out um, if there is something that becomes available? I don't know if there's been any work done on that, Adrian. Don't have to answer straight um, away, but yeah, no, I'm I'm not aware if there there has been work done on that, but a lot of people have spent a lot of time and energy um, working in that space. Um, within the Wellington region, um, I I did I didn't include them on here, but a lot of the councils are only collecting ones and two. Wellington City is collecting the fuller range, um, but it must be noted that the companies that are recycling that some of it is sort of quite boutique -y and not able to be um, expanded into bigger production. Um, but they are trying to find um, some ways to deal with it. Um, so, so there's a lot of energy being spent at the moment trying to resolve the problem, but there's nothing come to the fore that's commercially viable. Okay, I'll go uh, Deputy Mayor Milner. Thanks, Mayor Toby, and thanks for the um, further information, Adrian. Um, I come back to the waste management and minimisation plan that we've consulted on twice. And both times it said um, minimise waste to landfill and maximise community benefit. So for me, if we send more stuff to landfill, 
and that's the three to sevens, then we're going against that vision of that plan. So for me, that's a, a cross. I've looked to find the evidence of alternatives and I can't see any. In the report, there's no actual reference to what the costs would be. There, there's um, indication that there'll be transport and sorting costs, but there's no dollar value on those. And part of that information you sent through, Adrian, um, there was Raglan, which does the extreme zero waste, and they're still going to collect one to seven. And as part of the Haraki Reuse Centre that Duncan's been working with, they're looking to model themselves on that extreme zero waste. So to me, all of what we're trying to achieve, this decision would go against that. And also there was the one comment um, in the issues item three, it says, we hope for a market to become viable. Hoping for something's never gonna make it happen. So I need to see what we've actually done to make that um, come to fruition. Otherwise, for me, I can't support making any change at the moment based on the report in front of us. So for me, I would be sticking with the status quo until I can see some actual evidence and dollar figures to convince me that we need to make this change. Otherwise, we're just going against what we're trying to achieve as an overall vision. Councillor so. Milner, the um, plastic will end up in the landfill at this stage. So whether we stop collecting it or we continue to collect it, the plastic is going to end up in landfill. The waste minimization plan was prepared prior to uh, National Sword um, and the effects of National Sword um, have only become apparent over the last year and a half and you would have seen in the press that there's a lot of council councils have spent significant amounts of money um, in stopping the collection of threes to sevens and I think Christchurch and Auckland paid out several million dollars each to their contract collection companies um, as they moved away from that. Um, Raglan, the uh, council's collection in Raglan doesn't collect um, the plastic threes to seven. It is the recycling, the community recycling center, as you've indicated, that takes plastic threes to sevens. Um, and they are working on different options in that. But at this stage, um, we don't have the resources, um, both financial or staffing, to be able to put um, that level of work in to be able to come up with um, options in that. Um, they are being driven by outside groups and if the uh, power or community group is in the position at some stage to be able to accept threes to sevens, if it's got a market for that, then I'm absolutely certain that the council will resolve to um, allow plastic threes to sevens to be dropped off at the recycling centre and would encourage that. So just to clarify, when we're talking about um, if we stuck with um, the status quo where um, recycling products from one to seven went in the same bin, that would all go to landfill. If we stopped collecting plastics three to seven and only one to two went in that bin, the one to two would go into recycling and the three to seven will go into your general waste. Is that correct? Because we've got to be that careful what we, what we ask for here. Yes, if we, so, so if we that is my... status quo, we, we run the risk of landfilling our ones and twos, which are recyclable products. Is that correct? That is my um, personal uh, belief. I haven't been able to, unfortunately, the guy who heads up um, sellers is not available at the moment, the, the uh, contract. Um, the... Um, because they collect the plastics all together, the plastic threes to sevens are continued, are, will be considered as contaminated product. And when, when there's a certain, when the contamination exceeds a certain amount, they just send a whole lot to landfill. So the reality is, is, is that um, there's a greater chance of it all going into landfill, plastics ones right through to sevens. If they are able to sort them, we would pick up the cost for that, but the plastic threes to sevens will still end up in landfill. I think we need some clarification whether recycling with um, plastics one and two is going to, we can understand that through the um, COVID issue that there's been some um, um, some issues with it. And I noticed some councils are getting back uh, into their recycling now. Um, but we need to know whether plastics one and two are going to be recycled and when that will start back up. We, I, I think we really need an answer. So that, that, that starts back up on Monday. Um, we go back to full um, collection services. It hasn't been formally announced yet, but the um, messaging will go out after this meeting. We go back to full collection from Monday the 18th, and your recycling will be collected um, 
on your week. So that's alternative weeks, but your yellow bags will go out weekly. So we'll go back to full weekly collections from Monday next week. So my next question, and I know there's a few others that uh, I got some, I apologize if I'm, if I'm running the floor. So at what point do we know that uh, with some certainty that if a yellow bin goes outside with only plastics one and two in it, that they are going through the recycled process and that we don't run the risk of it uh, looking like, oh, that looks like it's contaminated or could be contaminated. Mm -hmm. So it all just ends up going to landfill. Because if we do go out with stopping plastics three and seven, there'll be some people that are still very keen um, and I'll be one of them that wants to recycle one and two and know that that is actually getting recycled and not ending up in landfill. Yep. So the MRF um, won't start up immediately. The MRF, which is the recycling center, um, is looking to be fully operational again. I think the date is the 18th of June. So um, they will go two full cycles of um, refuse collection because just to make sure that the messaging has gone out and the messaging has got through. So they go through two full cycles of um, uh, recycling collection and then the MRF will come fully back on stream again and processing all of the recycling. And my understanding is that's about the 18th of June. Okay, Councillor Broad. Uh, thanks, Mayor Toby, and through you. Yeah, it's pretty disappointing that we, we find ourselves in this situation. Um, but overall, I think we need to follow our neighbouring um, council's direction. It's the same collection company. Um, with the cost to sort it, um, I really run a concern of um, all the, like you have, all the rubbish ending up in, or all the plastics ending up in landfill. I think we need a good education process going out and we need to um, get together with um, the other councils around us so that it's a common story to all of them because um, it's going to be the same collection people um, and we need to lobby the central government because at the end of the day the other ones drive it they got rid of one use plastic bags they need to uh, encourage manufacturers or uh, put some process into place that means that the plastics three to seven are no longer available and we need to and that's going to be a long-term thing that they're going to have to push through and it's not something we can do, but all we can do is educate. If there's no market for it, I, I'm concerned that the plastics that can be recycled will end up in landfill, which is actually going to be more damaging. So for me, it's going to be a re-education for me as well. But um, so for what the council's got forward, I'm, I'm, I'd be supporting option two, which is what the other two councils are doing um, at the moment. Councillor Daly. Thank you, Mayor Toby. Before uh, making a decision on this, I feel like there, um, there needs to be more information um, about it. I appreciate the work that you've already done, Adrian, and your team. I can imagine part of, of um, the time that you've ha already had to spend on it, and you're giving us your best direction. I understand that. However, my first one is, and always is. What does our contract say about this? Also, um, if I can just answer that, the contract says plastics ones and twos. So, um, in the past, when they've taken three to seven, it's um, it's just been something good they've done for us. They didn't have to do it. That's correct, but they also did it for commercial reasons, not only altruistic. Okay, so. What is going to be the most cost effective for us? What uh, part is it same as basically what everyone else has said, especially Councillor Milner, about our values that we've already set um, to say this is the path that we travel with this and the difficulty to actually change from that. I, I know we can say straight away, well, we're in a situation that was never really envisaged that we would ever be in. So if we were to change um, anything, can it be for a set time or um, not saying, you know, if everything's going to go into one place, can we say, well, it's only, we agree to it, but only for a set time so that we're not actually stepping right away from our values? What 
is that possible? What would it cost us? Um, and as far as all the other councils agreeing, that, that'd be great if we could go along with it. But I think that we need to do a little bit more work on this to um, before we say, yes, we're going to do that. Because for a lot of things, we lead other people. And while we want to be seen to be part of a collective group on this, I think that um, I just feel that I'd like to um, find out more about it. But thank you for the work already, Adrian. Um, Councillor Daly, the, I mean, my desire would be that we continue to collect plastics three to seven and that there's a market for it. Unfortunately, there is no market for it. And so us collecting plastics, threes to sevens, um, even if we keep status quo, even if the cost was absolutely neutral to the organization, the end result is plastic threes to sevens are going to landfill. Um, just collecting them puts other recycling at risk and also will help us incur additional cost. Um, so um, as soon as markets become available, and as I indicated, there's a lot of work going on by um, a, a lot of smart people to try and deal with plastics threes to sevens worldwide, not just in New Zealand. And New Zealand is putting a lot of energy into trying to deal with plastics threes to sevens. Um, it's, there's no additional information I'm able to provide on that because we don't worldwide, we just don't have an answer. Um, and so I'm not sure what additional information I can provide you. Adrian is correct. Every, every council in New Zealand and local government in New Zealand uh, have been working um, tirelessly with central government um, to work out what we can do. One, not only to, to reduce waste, but where does our waste go? And it's not just plastics, it's ties as well. That's the other, the other bugbear that there's no real home for, for ties yet. Somebody comes up with a, a method and treads them, um, but then we don't actually, that market seems to stop just like that. And then all of a sudden we've got big piles of ties again. The, the, the part that I wanted to get clarification before you do make a decision is that you need to be mindful that if you do stick with status quo, everything will end up at landfill. If we go with option um, stop collecting three to sevens, we still know and we can put our hands in our hearts and say to our community that plastics one and two will be recycled. Um, so it's, it's, it's a kind of a, a mixed approach. But about, you're right, we do need to educate people how to determine what are plastics one and two and three to seven. And, and you'll need to look at each individual item that you've got and see what it is, but it won't long if we can get that messaging out there. We'll go to Councillor you. Harris. Oh, sorry, you you got more, Carol? That my next question is, how do we go about educating um, the ratepayers or the people putting the rubbish out or recycle or whatever? How do we go about um, educating them to only put um, one and two out? Because for a, a lot of people, when you look around, they'll just throw anything that looks like recycle in, in the bin. So how long would we estimate that um, everything would probably end up in landfill because it would take a while to educate everyone? So we're expecting it to be take about a month. Um, the communities have shown that they're actually um, quite responsive to these changes. Um, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and so we've, got um, some work planned around getting that information out into the communities. We're going to be rebranding the bins um, and the such like. So there's quite a bit of work that's been done um, by the media teams um, across the three councils to um, align the messaging and to get that um, messaging out if, the, if that is the decision um, as, and also just educating. And that, that's why there's going to be a period of about a month that they, they're not going to recycle because um, they're expecting contamination during that month, but they expect that based on the previous responses that this community's had, by this community, I mean the Hauraki, uh, TCDC, MPDC communities, that it will only take about a month. Um, you'll still get small amount of contamination, but a small amount of co uh, contamination is easy to deal with. It's when there's bigger amounts of contamination, it's just not easy to deal with. It will be a tricky one. I mean, we've been trying to educate New Zealand for as long as I've been alive to not throw your rubbish out the car. 
um, but that still happens. So um, there will be the others that, that, that just don't follow through, as Adrian said. Uh, Councillor Harris. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Toby. Look, uh, I, I've sat and listened for the last 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, and I really do understand Paul, uh, Councillor Paul Milner's or Deputy Paul uh, comments around an aspirational uh, target. And uh, I'm surprised that Councillor Anne-Marie Spicer hasn't uh, joined into this conversation yet, but she's coming, I know she is. But I think at times we as councillors have got to make some very, very pragmatic decisions. I could not accept uh, the status quo uh, and then find that ones and twos are ending up in our landfill. That, do, that doesn't make sense to me. So I think we need to make a pragmatic decision. And uh, I've already heard Councillor Broad suggest that he's with uh, option two. I can see nothing else, no other information that Adrian can bring forward at this stage. Um, so for me, a pragmatic decision needs to be made and ensure that ones and twos are being recycled. Threes and sevens, we've already been told, will end up in the landfill. Doesn't matter whether we put them into recycling or not, that's where they're going to end up, at an additional cost to our rate pass. Thank you, Ross. We'll move to Councillor Gentil. Thank you, Mayor Toby. I'm same as all the other councillors, obviously. The more information we get, uh, I don't envy you uh, at all, Adrian. You're between a rock and a hard place with this, and it's uh, not really your call. But uh, at the end of the day, I mean, we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. Um, basically, uh, the money is going to come out from the ratepayers one way or the other. If we continue to do the three to sevens, then all the rubbish, will, well, all the recycling will go with the rubbish. If we go with just ones and twos, then the ratepayer is going to put out more rubbish bags full of threes to seven. So it's going to come out of their pocket either which way. So there is going to be a cost that will be questioned, I'm sure, by the ratepayers. I think, um, you know, we, we are stuck between the. I, I actually thought we had a post maker who was using the three to sevens, but obviously the, uh, the market wasn't there for it. But um, could we not lobby? central government continue, but as a group and say, look, we don't want anybody manufacturing anything out of plastics three to seven ever again. I know it's going to take a hell of a long time. We've got rid of plastic bags and I'm, I'm sure we can get rid of uh, vehicles to go to electric before we run out of electricity because of low water levels. But at the same time, it's something that we shouldn't just sit there and go, oh, well, that's just it. We just have to go with one and twos. Is it temporary? Is it something that we can look at for future reference to say, let's keep working on three to sevens or let's ban any company from using three to sevens. So if I can, the, the lobby group that, that is lobbying the government and working really, really hard with the government to get resolution on this is Wasteman. And they're doing a lot of really good work in that site, uh, in that place. So if, if you go to their website, you'll be able to see the work that they've done and they've worked with the Ministry for the Environment um, to do that. Um, your Worship, could I just share my screen briefly? Yeah, you can. I just, um, uh, I just, Langley might want to make a comment as well, just before you. Yeah, thank you. Not yeah, thank you to her. Just um, getting to the unmute. Thank you, Worship. So, um, one of the um, the um, things I think we have to do is sort of, sort of try and keep it in perspective, but not, but also not trivialise the need to recycle. And um, Adrian has mentioned around the volumes um, um, in the contract, uh, you know, it's a commercially sensitive contract. But if we go back to the March report, and um, it gives figures on what the percentage of recycling diverted through that month was. And if we say that 5% of that was um, um, plastics, mixed plastics, the one to sevens. And um, I, I um, um, recycle my ones and twos separately than my fives to sevens. So just anecdotally, I have to sort of a feel that it's mostly not more than 10 or 20% of the total plastic um, volume. So we're talking about perhaps an annual tonnage per year um, of, um, of uh, three to sevens um, that's going to landfill of about about somewhere I'd say between 18 or well, nine and 18 tons. And looking at Carol Daly, she will be able to tell me that that would all get on one of her trucks um, is what we're taking to, um, to, the, to the landfill. Um, and if we, if we look at what's going in a bag, if we, if we um, and look, these figures are provided because I've just been fiddling away with them now, but if we take it down to our rubbish bags, 
maybe about 43 grams a week per rubbish bag is going in. So it's it's actually, it's not a, it's um, again, not wanting to trivialize the need to um, recycle. It's, we're not talking big volumes here. And we need to, um, I guess, um, consider where um, we should be putting our real effort into in reduction. This is it in um, doing a whole lot of work around threes and sevens. Um, I, I know that kitchen waste is, can be about 25% of your, your um, um, annual um, refuse volumes. And if we could cut that in half, we really make a big difference. And that's an area that we could look at as well. So I know there's a lot of debate about this, but we are talking about um, actually quite a small amount of plastic. Um, any plastic to the environment I, I know is bad, um, but it is quite small. Um, so I just wanted to sort of share, put it in context in terms of the scale of what we're talking about. Thanks, Langley. Adrian, did you want to go back to your screen or have you, you're happy now? Yeah, no, it was just basically the, the contract specifically refers to these, the original contract document signed in 2013 refers to recyclables means at the date of this agreement, plastics one uh, is A, plastics one, B, plastics two, then aluminium, tin cans, glass bottles, paper and cardboard. So it specifically only refers to plastics one and two. Subsequently, the contractor made the decision to collect plastics threes to sevens because there was a market for that. And that was included in the um, uh, operational planning. Councillor Spicer, we'll just go with someone that hasn't asked the question. We've got two more, but you've, you've had a turn, so I'll get back to you guys. Um, we can't risk ones and twos going to landfill. That um, would be wrong. So I do support option two based on that information. We just, we need to be really open with our community. We do have motivated residents who are really keen to recycle. And so education is really important. And, and Council Board, I completely hear what you're saying there. We've been trying for a long time to get an education program out there and, and the Waste Minimization Working Party is working on that, but it is not happening fast enough and we need to ramp that up. Um, and Langley, I hear what you're saying about kitchen waste and I agree with you. I think you're absolutely right. And that's an area we could be focusing on because it does contribute massively to our waste problem. That's something we could be talking about now through our communications team and we're not doing it and it's really frustrating that we're not. So that's just sharing some thoughts there. And as far as recycling plastics three to seven goes, a lot of these things are things that we can avoid like bubble wrap or soft plastics. And yes, they can be recycled into fence posts or park benches, but then they become a finite product which can't be recycled again. And Duncan Smeaton has talked in the past about a circular economy and I keep bringing this up, but really that's just giving us an excuse to use these plastics that aren't really very good for the environment at all. If we can somehow steer away from using three to seven, we should be doing it. So that's my uh, two cents worth and I support option two. That sounded more like 78 cents, but um, we'll, we'll allow you with that one, Councillor Spicer. Deputy Mayor Melna, we'll come back to you. And then I've got uh, Councillor Smeaton. Thanks, Mayor Toby. Um, good, good discussion, and it's good that we're giving it a, a decent thrash around rather than just just a green. It's really disappointed that we're sort of half forced into this because two other councils neighbouring us have decided. So therefore, should we follow them or should we try and convince them to follow us? So sounds like that horse is halfway down the street now. Um, one of the things that's come out listening to this is we've told people to stockpile your stuff if you can and then put it out when it kicks off again. But then if I heard Adrian correctly, he said for the first month, they're just gonna chuck it all in the tip. So really wouldn't it be better to, if you've stockpiled for seven weeks now, stockpile for another month and then actually get your stuff recycled? Or it's kind of that mixed message. It's, it's really good if we can recycle the one and twos properly and get them made into other things. But if the contractor's just gonna throw their hands up and say, hey, it's all going to the tip for another month, I don't really think that's appropriate. If, if we're convinced our community is going to get behind it and get on board, and I'm sure they will, we need to actually follow it up with the actions, not just chuck it in the tip for another month. It's not really good enough, I don't think. So they, that was a pragmatic decision um, made by the uh, uh, solid waste working group um, across the councils um, because they felt that it would take two cycles of um, refuse of recycling collection um, before everybody had moved away from putting your yellow bags inside or your blue bags or your black bags, depending on which district you're in, into um, the recycling bins. 
um, A and B, that people would also then have time to start sorting out their plastics. Um, I can speak to the contractor to see if they're able to set up um, plastic 